Hi, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Chodesh Tov, Chav Sameach. The night before I started rabbinical school, I nervously sat around a table with five of my closest friends and ate a sheet cake. It had been a long time since my last first day of school, and all the anxiety and uncertainty and nervous energy had come flooding back in. And the reality was, I wasn't sure, even that night before. Since the last time I had been in school, I had been a server in a diner, a restaurant manager, a tutor, a brand manager for a real estate development company, a property manager, an event coordinator. I had lived in many states and traveled to many countries. I had lived a lot of lives and tried a lot of things, and none of it had felt right. So when I found myself on the precipice of this thing, this big new thing that I wasn't entirely sure I knew what to do with, I got quiet. I ate cake, and I listened to my friends talk and laugh, and I wondered, would this really work for me? Not only had I lived many lives before this, but I also didn't have a linear Jewish path. I didn't go to Jewish summer camp. I wasn't in a youth group. My family wasn't particularly religious. I didn't study Hebrew in college or Jewish studies or study abroad in Israel or anything else. I didn't grow up in LA or New York. I was a Midwesterner who had circuitously taken my Judaism with me on all my many stops, but never known quite what to do with it, until it felt like maybe I did. And so the next morning, long after all the forks had been washed and the leftover cake boxed up for us to take home, and final hugs and well wishes had been given and received, I took a deep breath, or a million deep breaths, and I went to the first day. When I started school, I met so many people whose paths were so clear. Their parents were rabbis, or they went to camp for 10 summers and were staffed for five, or were presidents of Jewish youth groups, definitely majored in Jewish studies in college. I didn't have the same vocabulary. I didn't know the right language. I certainly didn't have the right major in college. And with that, I also didn't have the clarity, clarity of purpose or of direction. It all felt so fraught for me. I couldn't match my internal experience to the external one. I had the feeling that we were supposed to be a certain way, act a certain way, and I was not those things. I didn't know how to just keep my head down and learn these texts without challenging what was being presented to us. It felt like there wasn't space for my whole self. I couldn't see a clear rabbinate for myself on the other side. I didn't even know what that would look like. And I couldn't get settled on the path toward it either. I couldn't make peace with school. I was unmoored by both parts. And I continued to be. I struggled mightily with the journey, trying to create some way that it could work for me, that I could feel sure and empowered and clear. But over the course of a few years, it wore me down. I could no longer remember why I had started in the first place. I was three years in and losing my way. And so I left. I worked at Beit Shuva as a spiritual counselor with people in early sobriety and coming out of the prison system. I tutored B'nai Mitzvah students. I went to many of Rabbi Kasher's classes. I taught Hebrew to first graders. I taught the prayer book with adults. I trained to be a doula. I made a life for myself, albeit a very Jewish one. And then I spent a lot of time thinking, imagining the kind of life I was creating for myself even out of school. A wise person asked me, do you think you really left the rabbinate or did you just leave rabbinical school? I got quiet. And obviously, eventually I went back to school, to that path, to that life. It's why I'm standing here and can tell you this story. And maybe it seems like it might be that I'm still uncertain after all those false starts. But in fact, I am certain because of those false starts, because of everything it took me to, it, because of everything it took to get me here. Sorry, pages are a little confused today. Now, this might seem strange, a strange way to introduce myself and this sermon, but it all came flooding back to me this week as I read about Joseph. No, I did not end up in a prison in Egypt and then eventually appointed very highly in Pharaoh's cabinet and then eventually confronted my brothers and tested them, but you get the point. There is something in his story this week that stopped me. Joseph can't quite figure things out. He can't quite get it right. 
He's thrown in a pit and then sold into slavery. Then he ends up in jail, then interprets dreams, then is eventually remembered in this week's Parsha and brought to Pharaoh to interpret his dreams. Then he gets a new name. Then there's a famine and his brothers who sold him into slavery in the first place come for food and then he tests them. They don't know who he is and he uses this to his advantage. And this week he starts to break down from all of this. He cries on two occasions, doing his best to keep it up, the charade, but it's starting to eat away at him. In one of these moments when his brothers have returned a second time for more food during the famine, it says, by my hair Yosef, Yosef, Yosef hurried away upon seeing his youngest brother Benjamin, and by vakesh coat, by avo hachadra vayef shama. He wanted to cry. He was on the verge of crying, and so he went to a room somewhere and he cried there. Joseph continues to be so rattled by the way that things are unfolding. His prolonged unsettledness is also marked by his outfit changes. This is, of course, the man known, as Sammy reminded us earlier, for his coat of many colors. In this week's Parsha, he changes clothes for the final two times in his story. His clothes are changed when he's taken out of prison and brought before Pharaoh, and then later he's clothed in robes of fine linen when Pharaoh appoints him to his new post. Those are the fourth and fifth times he changes clothes. Five times he changes clothes. Five different attempts to be himself, to find his way. And yet, in the same story this week, he's referred to as Ish Asher Ruach Elohim Bo, a man who has Ruach Elohim, the spirit of God in him. That phrase, Ruach Elohim, might be familiar to some of you. It takes us all the way back to Genesis to the very beginning, to God's creation of the world. In the second verse in our Torah, we have that phrase, Ruach Elohim. It says, Ruach Elohim merachefet al pnei hamayim. The Spirit of God spread out over the waters. But that's about God, and now we hear it about this sort of flailing Joseph. It turns out that this phrase, Ruach Elohim, is only used to describe one other person in our Torah. Which is not to say that others didn't have it, but it's only used in conjunction, conjunction explicitly with one other person, and that is Bitzalel, the chief architect of the tabernacle, who we will encounter again soon-ish in the book of Exodus. God says to Moses about Bitzalel, Va'amaleo to Ruach Elohim, that God filled Bitzalel with Ruach Elohim, and Moses later relays this to the people. Just these two people in the whole Torah, Joseph and Bitzalel. Now, Bezalel, like Joseph, is known for his connection with aesthetics. For him, his architecture. For Joseph, in his clothes. Again, the coat of many colors, or technicolor dream coat, as it were. But aside from that, their stories feel completely unrecognizable one from the other. Bezalel's arc is very straightforward. He's appointed as architect by God through Moses. He takes on the task, builds the tabernacle exactly as instructed, and that's that. Then it lives on outside of him. That couldn't be further from the truth of Joseph, the only other person singled out for having Ruach, Ruach Elohim in him. Joseph's path is scaling the side of a mountain in comparison to Bezalel's neighborhood walk. They aren't the same thing at all. Joseph had to change clothes five times before he could get to his self, his real true self, before he will announce in next week's Parsha to his brothers, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph. It didn't come easy for him. It didn't come easy at all. So why these two seemingly opposite people? What do they both teach us? Maybe they come to remind us that the Spirit of God is in both the detail-oriented, appointed, uncomplicated journey of Bezalel and also in the winding, false start-filled journey, false start-filled, harrowing, uncertain journey of Joseph. Wherever on that spectrum we find ourselves, there's divinity in our paths, too. There's divinity of the path of the colleagues whose parents are rabbis who always knew this is where they'd end up. And there's divinity in the path of the dabbler in all things who never saw this twist coming. There's divinity in the path of the person who met their partner in high school and spent their lives together. And there's the divinity in the path of the person ending the relationship they thought they'd spend their lives in because they realize it's not serving them anymore, that something isn't quite adding up, trusting that one day, somehow, it will all make sense. But sometimes, at least for me, the more I feel that my path is unsettled, is less linear, is less obvious than, the, than what I'm seeing reflected in the lives around me, I start to retreat. I start to feel like maybe it's not true. 
that Ruach Elohim is in Joseph too. I start to feel like maybe that's reserved for, for Betzalel. Maybe that's reserved for more traditional paths, clearer, easier to explain. There's a story in Tractate Eruvin in the Talmud about Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananiah. He reported that there were only three times in his life where anyone had defeated him in some kind of verbal encounter. One with a young girl, one with a young boy, and one with a woman. Of course, at the time, these three categories of people were not the ones expected to get the best of an established rabbi, so it adds to the effect of the story, though, of course, we know much better than that now. The story with the young boy goes as follows. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananiah was walking along a path, and he saw a young boy sitting at a crossroads. And he asked him on what path he should walk to get to the city. The boy said to him, this path is short and long, and that path is long and short. So Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananiah took the path that was short and long. And as he got closer to the city, he saw that he was stuck. He was not on the direct path he imagined to the city. He, so, as, so he walked back to the boy. He said to him, I thought you said that path was short. And the boy said, but didn't I also say it was long? And hadn't he told him that clearly? Had Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananiah forgotten? Or had maybe he just heard the first part? He heard short and was so desperate for an easy answer that he didn't listen for the rest of what the boy said. But when the story tells us that he got stuck on the path, the language says he encountered ganot ufardesin, gardens and orchards. The things that discouraged him from continuing on the path were gardens and orchards. He was so stuck in a vision of the straightforward and short path he had imagined for himself that he couldn't even appreciate what was in front of him. He was so fixated on the city he hadn't yet reached that he couldn't marvel at the orchards or at the gardens. He couldn't smell the flowers or sit in the shade of one of the trees or listen to the birds. He could only see where he wasn't. So much of the time we are on a path that is short and long, or maybe the one that is long and short. At least I know I am. So much of the time it's easier to be resentful of the simpler path you think you could have, should have, would have had. You know that story? That endless what-if game that will destroy you if you let it, that will chip away at you and your self-worth and confidence and hope? The truth is there would have been beauty in that simpler journey too, certainly. You could have been appointed to build a tabernacle that the Israelites carried in the desert to house God. You would have had Ruach Elohim there. The spirit and presence of God would have shown up. But you would have missed the gardens and the orchards. You would have missed interpreting dreams and being thrown in a pit and moving up into service of Pharaoh and saving Egypt from famine. You would have missed all the human experiences of tears, of becoming overwhelmed by everything you'd encountered. You wouldn't have gotten to wear five different outfits, to try on so many ways of being. And you wouldn't have had the triumphant moment of revelation after all of that where you got to say, this is who I am, me, just like this. I am enough. There's Ruach Elohim there too. God is there too. Here, on the most harrowing paths, the longest ones, the most inscrutable. There's Ruach Elohim and the nervous sheet cake eating that auspicious night before this journey began for me. In the hope and the fear and the uncertainty. In the restaurants and the property management and the tutoring and the moving and the traveling. In the trying and the fighting and the leaving. And also in the coming back. Trust that you're making your way, and that when the time is right, you'll be somewhere clearer than you ever imagined. Shabbat Shalom.